the next two subjects before I complete this class, first is talk about the legal subjects that are required as a minimum to, to be using in entrepreneurship. And the next one is funding as well, the minimum knowledge you would want to have in funding. So, the, so the, um, the ethical culture, the concept of having an attorney, the idea that it's okay to be drafting some agreements, the um, fact that you're gonna have to avoid legal disputes, you may need permits, and then you will have to choose some kind of form of a legal um, entity for your enterprise. So um, an ethical culture through thinking about legal documents, I think the, um, the idea is that you want not to be taken advantage of. You don't want to take advantage of other people. And I think the most important is you want as much clarity as much as possible. So this requirement is even more important when this business has more than you inside this business. Maybe it's a there's a partnership, maybe there's two or more people, maybe there are people that are um, investing time and you want to have as much um, clarity in order to keep everyone loyal and uh, not feel like there's a threat. You want to avoid getting in trouble by having a good conduct Choosing an attorney is very important. So in my situation, <clears throat> I found that they are very expensive and they are necessary. They are necessary sometimes because there is a task that you cannot do. And sometimes there's a situation where you need their experience um, because they deal with situa some situation more than you do. And, and also they know a, no, a number of things that, you sh that one should not say because it could, even though it's, it was said in a very honest way, it could backfire to you. So they will sort of protect you just in case. There are different types of attorneys. And that's another thing that's important is to choose the attorneys that will give you the best, so the best knowledge for the, the need that you have. There's some people that are overall business attorneys. And as business attorneys, they work on creating companies, doing contracts, and uh, doing intellectual property. Then you may say, well, I would rather have attorneys that are specialized just in intellectual property. The more the attorneys are specialized, the more efficient, but the more expensive. Um, sometimes, so the way I, I learn from mentors, you know, I, and I think that's, that's not in the slide, but I think that's very important, is I think it is good to have mentors, people that have experience and they can tell you in certain situation, if they were an attorney or what would an attorney say because of their experience, maybe having paid an attorney, they know what attorney would say and they can give you this feedback and save you a lot because you may still be using an attorney, but you will use them for less hours. Uh, most of the time, I would say, you know, 75% of the time, if not more, the attorney would be paid per hour. So if you run into a situation and you speak to someone who has not, who is not an attorney, so it's not 100%, but it's someone that's a lot of experience and you know that for a fact, their feedback will save you maybe 50% of the uh, honorarium of the hour work of your attorneys. So I tend to have good mentors that help me for that and other things. And then I have what I call a BB gun, a BB gun attorney, which is an attorney that does many different things in business and their hourly rate is more reasonable. And then I have what I call bazooka 
attorney, which are much more specialized and much more expensive that I use for specific situation. And, um, and I learned a lot from this. Another thing that is not in this slide and not uh, anywhere, and it should not be actually on the internet because it's a very good advice. I mean, this advice I'm gonna give you is gonna sort of pay for itself, which is that when you develop a business and then you have investors or partners that go inside your business, get them to pay for the fee of in integrating them in the business. So I just give you an advice. I could give this advice to a hundred people. I'm lucky if, or lucky if one person remembers this. Uh, this advice just, I just gave you is easily uh, $50,000 savings advice. So I'll repeat it just because I care, which is that you will have a business eventually in your life, I, I'm pretty sure, and you may have ma many businesses and that may be something that you like to do. When you have those businesses and you integrate a new partner, get the new partner to pay for the, their integration in the business on the legal fees. Normally, when you have a new partner that comes, they usually give some money or give some kind of valuable something in order to get into the business, in order to get a share. That's normal, everybody knows that. They also get them to pay for the legal fees in order to get into the business. Why is this important? Because legal fees are very expensive and they will be more than happy to pay because at the beginning, everybody is nice and sweet and they, they want to go into your business. They'd be more than happy to pay for the legal fees in order to get into the business, number one. So they won't be happy to do that the, a year after that, but right before coming in, they'll be more than happy to pay. And number two is oftentimes when people want to go into a business, they sort of going to muscle their way in getting the best deal in getting into this business. It's going to cost a lot of hours that you're going to have to pay you are, or your corporation to get this person inside. And if they are the one paying for it, they're going to be much more agreeable in getting into the business. And it's going to be much shorter because they are paying for it. So you're going to be able to better negotiate them come, to come inside because they will have all the attorney fees and legal fees on their shoulder. Anyway, if you didn't understand what I was trying to explain, just try to remember just this simple thing. Someone joining your business, make them pay for the legal expenses. And maybe in 10 years that you send me an email and say, oh, professor, remember that one recommendation I saved easily. I've done it many times and I've saved many times $50,000. Um, I've told that to people that are very successful people. They, they have, I've told this to someone that I know spent more than a million dollar a year of attorney fees. And he looked at me and he used the F word. Are you F kidding me? This is so good. And I said, you know, I tell that to my students. And he looked at me and says, they probably don't get it because he pays a million dollars. So he knows and he's like, wow. Do you tell that to your students? Wow, okay, great. Anyway, so select attorneys, take it seriously. This needs to be done, it costs a lot of money. It's gonna be a drag. There's nothing you should do against it. So you just gotta do it. And try to minimize the cost by doing the things I just told you. Drafting a founder's agreement is very important because the idea is that you have to say who gets what, who, how much equity and sweat equity is put into the business. It is very important if you've ever had a business, you probably have had the experience that it didn't go well. Um, if I had to say 50% don't go well or, or more, and they don't go well and they're going to go even worse if you don't have a simple agreement. So the first agreement that you do is called meeting of the mind you know a meeting of the mind a m o m a meeting of the mind is people say hey let's do a m o m so you go yeah let's do a m o m everybody wants to do nobody not doesn't want to do an m o m um, it's a little bit like a summary of what's been said and all of this so you do that because it's important. So what goes inside your little agreement is, what is this business gonna be about? Uh, uh, what would be the title of the people joining in? The manager, assistant manager, president, man, whatever. 
what is the legal form of ownership? So it's going to be a corporation or what sort of corporation? How many stocks and who gets how many stocks? Do we pay for the stocks? How do we pay? Is it just monetary or can we give some variable? Like we, you give uh, machines or you give intellectual property or you give sweat equity as well. So what is the money that you, the business start with and what are the buyback clauses, which in case this business doesn't go through um, and someone wants to pull out, how do you compensate them to leave for the shares that they used to have? Is there a timeline, whatever? The next one is avoid disputes. So to do avoid disputes is therefore work on MOM. Work on having simple agreements in order to minimize disputes because what's written is understood and is agreed. The next thing is you may need to get business licenses. So depending on what you're doing is, let's say you're doing concerts, maybe you need a temporary permit, you need some licenses. So every business needs a, a license to pay for a license. And usually you pay this to your city to get a city business license. Okay, so what are the different um, ownership structure? The simplest one is sole proprietorship. It's just you and you pick sole proprietorship. Sole proprietorship is great because it can be done very quickly. Um, it's just a county uh, process, filing some document in the county. You can do a do doing business as in the county and you become a sole owner of this business and you can start being legally um, existing and they have, that way you can um, use that for your taxes after. A partnership is more specific because the partnership is for um, usually attorneys actually have a partnership. So they have different people that have a different title and they have some that are titles. So they have an equal um, weight in terms of power of decision as being different partners and all that. So, uh, the doctors have partnership. Um, usually, if you have two people, like you're two musicians and you're doing a band, you will have a partnership, but you will def define this under a corporation. So you have multiple type of corporation. You have a C corporation and S corporation. And these two are different based on how many shares and how you deal with the taxes. And... Um, and if you want to make it public, or if it, it is private, which if you sell shares to the public, or if it's just shares to people that are allowed to buy shares. LLC, Limited Liability Company, is more recent than the S or C Corp. And it's sort of um, a very um, trendy form of business ownership because it's rather flexible in the sense that you can have quite a, uh, you can have foreigners go in your um, LLC. Um, I think it's uh, S Corp. I believe it's the S Corp where you can't have foreigners. I think you can in the C, but not in the S. Um, the limited liability also gives you a good uh, protection in case of uh, losses or uh, uh, um, bankruptcy. Um, it also helps you with your taxes because it's a pass through in terms of taxes. So all of these are usually based on multiple characteristics. First characteristic is how much money do you have? How much risk do you have? So if you have a lot of money and a lot of risk, you take a more complex form like a, co a corporation. If there's less money, less risk, then you can take a sole proprietorship. The other thing is also um, if you want to make quite a lot of investment, you will pick a LLC or a corporation because you will want to have a tax a difference and tax reduction, maybe on your personal taxes. And there's a difference between the LLC, which is that you will get the uh, income and you will have of, of the business and you will have maybe another income 
and then you won't uh, you will be taxed for the business and and for your personal as a uh, with the one single income versus with the corporation is you get di- uh, you'll get uh, dividends from the business which means that you'll be taxed sort of twice one time for the business and two times for the income that you get from the business so th- there's books you know, 150 pages books written for a C corp, written for what's an S corp. So it can be very complicated. But the idea behind this is all about the risk, how much risk you have, how much money you're investing, how much investors you have, and how much, how many investors do you need? The more investors you need, and the more you want them to be. In, uh, a, a large number of investors with a small amount of money, the more you have to take a corporation, a C or S. The less investors and the larger the sum of money, then you'll take a LLC. So it all depends. In addition, you can always change from a, a corporation to an LLC and from an LLC to a corporation. Um, the issue as well between all of these is the administration. Um, corporation, C or S, as month, uh, monthly administrative duties and filings versus the LLC as annual filings. So that's also uh, to take into account because it's, it's more burden if you're a small business to take, an, uh, to take a corporation. It's less bur- administrative bur- burden to take a LLC. So LLC are sort of what many small business will start with who have some assets, some investments, some investors, but they want to start with a format that is, that is lighter. However, that doesn't mean that it's only for small businesses to have LLC. Um, Chrysler, just to give an example, is an LLC and it's not a small uh, company. So it, it all depends. Do you have any questions maybe at, at, on these? No. Okay, so then the, the, the next issue about legal is, is an issue that I think you're extremely averse because you had cl- one class, I think, just on this. So it's the issue of copyright, patent, and trademarks. So uh, they are not the same, obviously, but they're part of, of the intellectual properties. So the copyright uh, protects the creative part of uh, intellectual property. The patent protects the, um, the, 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 the way the, the, the mechanism of the intellectual property, such as uh, the way it functions, the way it operates, that's the utility patent, or also the visual, the form it has, which is called the design uh, element of the patent. And then the trademark mostly protects the brand, but it can also protect the slogan. And it can also protect some elements which have to do with uh, um, something visual or something, um, a sound as well. So it sort of can cover through the trademark some elements that would be connected with the patent and the copyright, but most likely the trademark is the brand name. So now funding. Um, so why do we worry about funding? Is because you may have a need of money because this business needs to create samples. And therefore to create samples, maybe uh, you have to have capital investment for buying physical things to start. Maybe you have money to buy the, the basic things, physical things to start, but you need money in order to run the business. So in that situation, it's a cash, cash flow. So maybe you can start the first two months, but on the third month, there's gonna be a certain amount of needs that will occur. So maybe you need the, the money for the marketing. So you don't need the money at the beginning. You need the money when you're launching. Um, maybe it's, it's money for afterwards because you have money for, starting the business, you have money for running the business, 
but you need money in order to scale the business up in order to have the next generation of products going after the next generation of customers. So it's a longer term investment. So investment to start, investment to run, or investment to invest in the business for the future. So where can you find the money? So the obvious one is from your own personal funds, but you also have equity capital that I will discuss, debt financing, and then some creative methods that we'll discuss. So personal funds um, is uh, essentially the savings that you have or the savings that your family member may give you. So these eventually can help you. Um, the, um, oftentimes the best with this from an experience is when family does not loan you the money. So you need uh, $10,000, uh, getting $10,000 from your from family and friends is tough. It's tough because it changes, it can um, impact the relationship. It is much better when family and friends tell you, you know what, I cannot give you 10,000, but I can give you a thousand, but I don't need it back. So I'm investing in you for your success. Uh, the minute you give money to somebody, you most likely lost this person. So it's much better to not make it as a loan, but make it as a gift. So within personal, with, within close friends, maybe not giving the full amount, but giving a partial amount because the gift will still be well taken and then it doesn't change the relationship. You're still very grateful for the money that was given, but you don't feel this burden of having taken money that you don't know if you can give back. So again, this is an advice from someone who has a lot of experience on this subject and has learned from, from good people. And that's, all, that's what they've been told. And I've noticed it that, yeah, don't give money to, a, do not loan money to your best friend because you're going to lose your best friend. If it's your best friend, give your best friend some money and give, wish, them, wish them luck. And so anyway, you'll find this for yourself just uh, as life is. Um, the next thing is bootstrapping. So uh, bootstrapping is trying to minimize and uh, trying to uh, minimize how much you need from other people by using your own resources. So instead of buying is you're renting, instead of buying new, you buy used. Instead of buying you by yourself, you coordinate with another business. Um, instead of buying cash, you try to have uh, payments, uh, installments. Um, you try to minimize unnecessary expenses. When you have a startup and you do it at the beginning, I don't know why it's that way, but it's the same for everyone. You overspend. You, there's things that you think are important and you overspend on this. And then you regret it because it's money that you need for something that are more important. So ask yourself twice if you really need to spend this money. Um, use sources, look for specific sources um, that may be, you know, selling in bulk or um, selling cheaper. I mean, the internet, you know, wish, you go on wish, you go on wherever. Um, and you become resourceful because you want to try to save your money. So one thing people don't realize is you can use the resources from the university sometimes, such as if you need to do some research, call a professor and ask them if they have any students working and that they would want to take a, a project. And they do the work and you save some money and you have access to databases that are very expensive. The databases that we have access as students and professors are worth 40, 50, $100,000. And we are getting it, not for free because you're paying for your education, but you, you're getting it, if you don't use it, it's lost and it's available there. And so uh, businesses will, it will be too expensive for them to get it, but they can get it through a student and the students get to learn experience and all that. So that's where you will want to work for free because you're learning from the experience of this business and this business will get the experience, the, the feedback for free. Um, now you want to get some money from someone else. So you have to precisely think about how much, much money you need. 
and then which method of getting uh, the money is the best? Either get some kind of uh, debt or sell some shares for someone to get your product. So this is important for you because that's what you see in Shark Tank 99, 100% of the time, not even 99. So in Shark Tank, someone comes and says, you know, I want, I'll give you uh, a dollar for every product that we sell if you give me $20,000. Or I will give you 10% if you give me $20,000. So this, you get it, I get it, everybody gets it. Now, what's interesting for you on your work on your presentation is to think about how much money do you need? Do you need it for cash flow? Do you need it for capital? Do you need it for investment? Why do you need this money? So the A papers, the A papers go into the why. Which money do they need? How much? And why do they need the money? And then they go into explaining if it's going to be a debt or if it's you know, some, some royalty that they're going to give to the investor or if it's an equity or if it's both you can minimize the equity and increase the royalty, right? Where you say, I'll give you 5%, but this much per product that we sell, or 10%, and you get paid by the profits of the company. So the company makes profits, you get paid. In the break-even analysis, we're going to show how we're going to use the money, and we're going to show when you will get your royalty or your, um, your uh, financial equity through the business based on the share that you have. So you have to explain that. And so how much you evaluate these to be is very important. And how much you're asking the client for a million, $200,000. And what is it for? And then obviously is how do you make the investor feel about the opportunity? Is this an opportunity that we know you know, it's a matter of time, it's going to happen and it's already happening now, or if it's an opportunity that you, it's a stretch. Okay. And then there's another element, which is sort of difficult for you to do uh, in, in this class, but in the reality is in your own presentation. So it's not just about your charisma, but it's more about the skills that you have, the skill sets and the expertise that you have in what you're going to ask money from us, um, the investor. Because if we feel that you have the experience, you've, you know, it's like you've worked in a, a company before that gave you a very high level experience and now you're using this experience and now investing it in your own company and you will solve a problem, that gives a high level of confidence that you can do it. So equity funding means you give a share. Debt financing means that you're getting a loan and you have to pay this loan back with a monthly type of return. Talking to an investor uh, means that you're going to have to do a fast pitch, elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is like a 60 seconds, two minutes talking to an investor. So what do you say? So as an example, describe the opportunity or the problem. What is it, the problem that, what is the need that you're solving? What is the problem you're solving? Next, how is your problem solving, or how is your solution solving this problem? What's the opportunity? What do you do? How does it solve it? Then describe your qualifications. Is why, why would you be able to solve this problem? Why you? Describe the market and then describe how much money you, you need and what you're going to do with it and when can I expect a return. And this is quickly a picture because in 2007, so that's been 15 years ago, I started working on an elevator pitch competition, which is the Wells Fargo Center for Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Wells Fargo is the biggest bank in America. And since 2007, they have sponsored me. I'm the only professor in the US sponsored by the largest bank in order to train the student to think outside of the box. So as soon as I joined in 2007, I created the Wells Fargo Center competition for investors. Back then there was no Shark Tank. Shark Tank started in 2008 or nine. And I was now inspired by the popular inspiration of Shark Tank. Most of the professors at CSUN were booing me for doing this. They say it's a waste of time, but it's not a waste of time because now it's all over the place. Again, I was an entrepreneur, even as a professor. As a professor, actually, I think I'm entrepreneurial. There's a lot of things that I start and I get booed and people say no and no and good luck, son. I got that too. It doesn't matter. I knew he was right. 
I did it. And we see uh, now there's like a dozen of those competitions just at CSUN. Back then, I think it was the first one in California anyway. So I keep doing it. And uh, you can even see, um, you see Robert Tegarden and um, uh, Brian McKinsey had participated uh, in one of these when they were students. And I have all kinds of students and the students absolutely love it. And I love it too. Um, do, do, do I get rich from this? No. Why do you do it if you don't get rich? Because it's the right thing to do anyway. That's just me. So now, source of equity funding. So you have venture capital, business angel, and then you have the, um, uh, the banks. I'm actually, uh, uh, yeah, the banks, no, the banks won't give you equity, sorry. So business angels is the lightest form. The business angels, there's not too many in the US, um, and they are very good in investing at the beginning in startups. So they don't invest huge amount of money between 10,000 and more. And they are looking to, um, for a small percentage. And eventually uh, when they invest, they're not often get involved. So the business angels don't, don't get involved too much. Uh, the type of business angels you have close by are the Tech Coast Angel, the Maverick Angels, and the Pasadena Angels. So what these are clubs, they're clubs that meet. And they, when they meet, what do they do is the same thing I do with the Wells Fargo is they have a bunch of people that come and they just pitch and they listen to them. And after they listen to them, they do a little, uh, you know, toast and then people mix and everybody goes and, and it's court. They court everyone and they try to exchange business cards for another meeting with them and so forth. So it's foot in the door. Sometimes the business angels are a little bit more structured where in fact the business angels uh, some top board of directors, the business angels, review the candidate, pick the best candidate, train the candidate for the event. That way the events are much more fun for the people to come to the event and they are more groomed. And then eventually people see some well-organized and then through uh, the, the, the club, they will do another presentation and another presentation and all that until there's enough people that are interested and they start investing. So that's usually what you start doing first the next one is called venture capital. So the venture capital, there is about 800 uh, virtual uh, venture capital in America. Uh, this is organized as an, as an organization. And so these organization have members and um, they put money inside the venture capital and then they vote for where their money goes. So it's more structured, it's more, um, uh, organize it's more formal where people go pitch to them usually after they've had a company which had angel investor investing and now they're more uh, they, they've launched the business they have some uh, the, some uh, sales going on and they need more money and therefore they need someone and they don't want to work with the bank they need to someone that's going to put some money and also have some real skills so usually the venture capital are specialized. They are like venture capital in computer technology, venture capital in communication, venture capital in entertainment, venture capital in the pharmaceutical industry. And therefore they will be excited to hear people in their specialty and they will know quickly if, if they like it and if they think that the organization should be investing in this business. Um, so usually what they do is they go and build stages. So the venture capital said, okay, so you say you need a million dollars. What we're gonna do is we are looking at your business and we're gonna ask you to tell us, give us three stages where we're gonna invest 400,000 and then um, 300,000 and then 300,000 at the three stages. And so you need to organize this within this three stage, stage of investment we need to see the scale up. Why would you want to have stages or why would you present stages is because you would show that, um, because when you request a large amount of money, it's brutal to ask a million dollars at once. So it's much more realistic that you won't need all of this money at once. It could be $10 million, that you won't need all of this money at once, but in fact, you will need it for specific situation that the company is going through. So therefore you will see 
that there's the first situation where you need the money in order to, to move you into another stage. And when you get to that stage, there is another need of the money. And that way it makes everybody feel comfortable. It reduces the risks and it's more realistic, like what you would get from a bank. So um, I wanted to have this little pause here, which is how, how do you make money as a, as a startup or as an entrepreneur? You make money because you pay yourself based on the sales, the profits, and so forth. But you could be an entrepreneur. I mean, there is one that is very famous. His name is Elon Musk. What do you mean? You could be Elon Musk and say, you know what? I, make, I don't make that much money from the company, but I make money from selling the shares of the company. Ooh, that's interesting. So you create, you, you're saying that you could be creating companies, yeah? Where you make no money, yeah? You could even be creating companies that make no money. Yeah. You could be creating companies that are actually negative, that lose money, and you could still sell them and make money. Yeah. Wow. So that's a different concept. I mean, obviously, if you say that to someone who's over 60 or over 80 years old, they think you're crazy because that's not the way life was. But that's how YouTube. Um, uh, a uh, startup was created is they made no money, they lost money, and they just tried to survive until they sold it for $2 billion, and then they got $2 billion. So it was worth working for five years for free to eventually get $2 billion for the work that you did. So sometimes, and that's why, again, it's important to understand that entrepreneurs can work for free because they could see the big picture at the end of the road, which is that they will make money, not from what the company is gonna generate in terms of profit, but from the equity, the sales of their equity. And that's how they may make money. So they are like, they are like patiently building the equity of the company. They're not getting rich from this, but then when they sell the baby, that's when they get the big, the big bucks, okay? So finally, therefore, what are, the, what are debt financing? And debt financing is going to a commercial bank with a marketing plan, with a business plan, and telling them your project, and then they will give you some money, usually with some collaterals. So if, they, if the amount is big, they will ask for collaterals. If you have not a good uh, track record of sales and profit, they will ask for more collaterals. But if your track record of sales and credit you may have a company that already has built credit and you have a very high uh, credit rating as a company, then the commercial bank will give you some money due to your high credit. Or you could work with uh, debt financing through the uh, government and they're called SBA loans. So the government, um, what they do is they, you submit to the SBA, to the government, they review your company and then they give you SBA accreditation. The government does not give you money, but the government gives you accreditation, which allows you to go to a commercial bank. And then the commercial bank will use the accreditation from the government as the collateral, which means that the government says, you, I approve you for $50,000. Then you go to the bank and you say, I have a government SBA approved loan of $50,000. And then the bank are going to jump on you because it's guaranteed by the government. If you don't pay it, the government pays the bank and therefore you're good. So the government has some money that they have accumulated that they keep on the side to help businesses go and, and develop. Yes, Denise. Is this also how real, real estate investment works or is that different? Uh, real estate is different. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so for real estate, it's, it's not the same. This is for business in general. Like, um, you know, you're going to do, um, 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 I don't know, like a festival, mm -hmm. like a Coachella festival, and you're creating this entertainment company. And then you say it's sort of another Coachella, but it's on Catalina Island. And I need money for this and this and this and that and that. And I work for five years here and five days there, I have the experience. Here's the business plan. Here are the investors, I have 50% of the money already that I got from investors. And here are the musicians that already said that they're gonna help launch it or whatever. You create this into a business plan, you submit to the SBA, the SBA approves you for the money. 
so it's for it's for businesses for real estate it's different because it's going to be um based on the on the real estate and the project so it's it's a different type that's what happened with the fire festival right yes the fire festival well the fire festival was um yeah it was a scam because he was paid by by selling the ticket way ahead of the event and not paying for anything of, or not much uh, that was happened so you know he was supposed to pay the suppliers he was to pay, supposed to pay a lot of people and when the people went there there was there was no concert hall there was no not that much food there was no hotel i mean they were just small tents so he got i don't know just to put a number, he got millions of dollars, but let's say he got 1 million and he was supposed to spend 800,000 and he got 1 million and he spent 100,000. And when the people came, there was nothing. So that was a scam. I see. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Denise. Thanks. So all of these are inside, if you go in Canvas, in the file section, it says lecture. And inside the lecture, you may have seen it already. There's lecture one and the lecture two in there. So as all the slides uh, that I presented. 